Good day, everybody. Um, I want to welcome everyone from uh, Australia and New Zealand joining our session today. Uh, my name is John Snayman and I run our modern workplace and Azure business in Australia. So this is our second in our series of webinars. Last one was about working from home and using uh, technology such as Teams and Azure Virtual Desktop. So this one is about securing the new remote workforce and it will be presented by Gavin van Niekerk. <clears throat> so just a little bit of housekeeping. So you'll see there's a question and answer or question mark button that you can go to ask questions. Uh, what I want to ask is if you joined as a guest um, to please identify yourself so that we can follow up if, if we don't get to answer your particular question during the session. And at the end of the session, we do have a Q&A uh, time that we'll allocate and the live meeting will change over to a Q&A session. We will answer all your questions that you've got there and we'll get Gavin to answer the, some of those. So during the during the session, we will endeavor to answer some of your questions in that in that area of the chat. But if we don't get to it, we'll we'll get Gavin to answer some of the questions at the end. So uh, with that, I'll hand over to Gavin. Thank you, John. So good morning and good afternoon to those on the, the webinar. As John said, my name is Gavin. I work for Empired in Australia. I'm the practice lead um, within the Modern Workplace team. I also lead the cybersecurity team. So really pleased that you took this opportunity to join us on this webinar, which I think is a very pertinent and hot topic at the moment. As John said, please feel free to post your questions. We'll be answering as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. So a little bit about myself. Been involved in the IT industry for more than 20 years now. I have a specific focus on cybersecurity and Microsoft's capability within that space. This is quite a compelling statistic, I believe. Just three weeks ago, less than 3% of our colleagues would have been working remotely. The figure, sure, is debatable, but I don't think any of us will argue there's been a dramatic shift in the way and manner we are working today. Wow. Now contrast the previous figure to the figure that we have in front of us, 98%. All of our businesses have been thrown into remote working as the new normal, as a result of the requirements around self-distancing, and potentially isolation to reduce the fallout of COVID-19. If we contrast these two positions side to side, we can ask ourselves the question, how does our security posture hold up against this new normal? We all designed and measured success of our security posture on this working assumption of the 3% that is. Today, we have new assumptions. Today, we need to rethink based on 98% being our new normal. So what do we need to be thinking about? Well, certainly the potential risks, some of these are not new, as, as phishing attacks against identities, we've, we've seen that before. Phishing certainly is not new. Ransomware on devices, data exfiltration, data leakage. So what do we do about these risks that have certainly increased? And we'll be sure to talk through that uh, in the presentation. I believe we need a holistic plan. We need a plan that covers identity. We need a plan that covers devices, as well as data and applications. Let's talk about the media. What has the media been saying? Granted, we likely need to review this feedback with a fair amount of salt. I'll leave the topic of fake news for a separate webinar. I won't get sucked into that. Uh, I think that introduces complexities of its own. So we'll leave that for another time. But nonetheless, the articles and press that has been shared 
is certainly concerning. We've seen a lot of articles come through the media, whether it's the formal media channels in terms of, of news or press or social media. I don't think it can be argued that the COVID-19 pandemic has unleashed a wave of, of cyber attacks. So how do we protect ourselves? As I said previously, we've seen an uptick in crafted phishing attacks as we've seen in the past where we've faced crisis. The bad guys take advantage of the stress, anxiety and fear to push their agenda, whether this is identity compromise, credential theft, ransomware, as I mentioned previously, or espionage. We've seen an uptick in attacks on VPN services and providers of VPN services. Some of this appears to be initiated by nation state actors and sometimes by well organized crime groups. All of this, as stated before, is concerning. But my intention here, and I want to be clear about this point, is not to push fear, uncertainty, and doubt messaging, commonly referred to as FUD. It's certainly not the intention of this webinar. So let's try to start looking forward and build on some of the positive things we can do. Yes, we still need to be realistic about the constraints of the new remote working world we are now working in, but there are things we can do. I will introduce you to a term that I will use interchangeably within the presentation and a couple of other terms that will relate during this webinar. This is what I refer to as the security control plane. Fundamentally, the security control plane has shifted. We know identity is the new control plane. This has been the case for a while now. We've shifted away from the old castle mentality, if you will, the castle type picture, if you can visualize it in your mind with the moat, the water moat around the castle that essentially provided protection. So we've shifted from that to identity being the new boundary. But is this enough? I ask the question. By itself, identity as a control plane is a con good control, but I believe we need to shift to include device health, session risk scoring, with the desired outcome being dynamic control. So I think we've talked enough about the background. So let's get into some more specifics. Let's start considering some approaches. This may not be a fit for organ organizations, but it's intended to spark some thinking, some conversations, if you will. We're cognizant of the fact that organizations may approach this slightly differently. As I said, the intention is to spark conversation and thinking. So as mentioned before, with the use of the term security control plane, we have similar and related terms, depending on the group of analysts you prefer to follow or subscribe to. Gartner and Microsoft position the security control plane as zero trust. This would be a term for security experts that are involved in the security in industry would be a well-known term. Forrester has a very similar position. They refer to it as the security control plane as lean trust. All of these terms, security control plane, zero trust, lean trust, all have similarities and common elements. The intention of these security architectures is to strive to reduce risk. Let's review some call outs for clarity. We will use zero trust as our foundation. So zero trust is not literal. You can't build a practical strategy around absolutes. 
zero trust is not an adjective. You aren't going to be zero trust. Your users suddenly aren't going to fall into a state where they're not trusted or in some kind of state of, of zero trust. That's not the intention behind this architecture. Zero trust is, is not for sale, unfortunately. We do joke internally, I think if we could can up zero trust into a one flick switch and you suddenly have zero trust, um, I think we would all be very wealthy and done very well for ourselves. There is certainly acknowledged capability and technology as both the analysts call out and Microsoft and other service providers provide technology with the goal of, of reaching zero trust, as we said previously, with the outcome of ideally managing risk. Zero trust is not instantaneous. You can't boil the ocean. I think we need to be practical, as I said previously, about the constraints that we may have in this new remote working, remote workforce, constraints that we have potentially from skill set perspective within the teams that we have, resourcing constraints, budgeting constraints, all of these are realities that we, we need to deal with. Zero trust is not a revolution. Rather, we need to be building on, on, on what we have, what we have in place already. We have infrastructure. We have networks, we have devices. So the intention rather from starting from scratch is to go through a process of iteration, if you will, to uplift, modernize, and amend the current capabilities and certainly supplement where we have no service capability or technology. Our desired goal, as stated before, <clears throat> is to push towards strong identity. This is a point that we will talk in a little bit more detail to. We have strong identity, but not only that, we have device health. We're pushing towards the principle of least privilege, plus verified user access through the use of telemetry to give us insights not only into the identity and the possible risks associated with the identity, but also device session risk if there is such an understood risk within an ongoing session. Okay, so hopefully now we have some clarity around the security control plane and zero trust security architecture. How do I make any of this a reality? Let's look at a sample <clears throat> maturity model which can be used as a fairly quick gauge to understand where, as an organization, we are likely positioned. We have the basic level in this representation. This is the traditional level. We have the advanced level in the middle. We have, finally, the optimal level. Ideally, we want to be pushing upwards towards the optimal level. Some practical ways that can be used to measure the level is to ask a question at each level in the sense of, do we as an organization have strong authentication? If the question to this is no, then we have some work to do fairly quickly. If by strong authentication, we mean multi-factor authentication. Uh, this is an absolute must do, um, not just for our high privileged users in terms of administrators, global administrators, high impact users, or, or high risk users in the sense that we have executives, we have stakeholders within organization that may have access to sensitive data. Strong authentication needs to be equally and liberally applied across the whole organization. This is not just for cloud services. It would be another clarification in that space. We're only as strong as our weakest link. 
So if we have strong authentication, as an example for Office 365, but we ha have other cloud applications or applications that are potentially published out to the internet that aren't using strong authentication, or still some legacy protocols that simply do not support strong authentication, do not support modern authentication in terms of multi-factor authentication. We still have holes within our security posture. We still have gaps. Let's talk about how we start pushing up into maturity. So we're building on what we have. If we've asked a simple question, and granted this is not the only question to clarify whether we can move from traditional to advanced, but we build on what we have. We believe we have modern authentication, majority of applications, ideally all of the applications. Now we look to enrolled and managed devices. Here the distinction is we want to be knowing the device that our users are using. We want some insight. We want some telemetry on that device. We want to be understanding if this is, as an example, a jailbroken device that will surely contradict with our policy and then introduce an unacceptable level of risk. We also need the ability to pivot in the opposite direction, if you will, and apply policy for unmanaged devices. This is much easier in a sense if we have a scope, we have a view of enrolled and managed devices. So let's look, what does the optimal part of the maturity model look like? Here, ideally and simply, we're driving to risk-based management. This is risk-based management, as mentioned before, not in one vertical, but across many verticals. So building on the capability that, that we have in terms of the services that we've enabled, sometimes the difficult projects that we've gone through to get multi-factor authentication rolled out across the whole organization, across all applications the difficulties we've faced and the complexities that we've gone through in, in rolling devices, whether these are Windows devices, Mac devices, iOS, Android, the list goes on. So we understand some of these projects are not easy and they, they certainly take time. Once we have that largely in place, we can build on that with a risk-based type approach across identity, device, and session. So some other points to spark conversation within your organization. Is there a virtual team? Is there a virtual team that can take hold of these programs, potentially traditional, focused, advanced, or ideally optimal, figure out an architecture that's appropriate for your organization? Do you know where, you're, where you are at today with your journey? Do you have buy-in from the C-level? Do you have buy-in from the organization? A lot of this may not be budgeted, granted, and we may need to seek exemption for special budget to address the risks that are pertinent and certainly ex exposing the majority of organizations. We need an approach to security which assumes pervasive risk. Then we can ask ourselves, how do we behave in an, in an environment of pervasive risk? So I wanted to share some of the customer questions. We deal with a, a large amount of, of customers on a regular basis, and I wanted to share some insights and give some, some guidance around this the thought process that we we go through as a team when we're posed with, with certain questions. How can employees enroll their devices into device management to gain access to company resources? The risk mitigation here, as we've said previously, is we want to be focusing on trusted devices only. Maybe this is a very simplistic example, 
but this assists us on our maturity curve as we push towards the optimal risk-based control plan. Potentially, we could use Intune for this. It may be a, a combination granted of system center in terms of system center configuration management plus Intune in a hybrid type approach. There may well be other platforms, other capabilities that provide very similar functionality, which should and also could be leveraged. How can security teams enforce device health checks per application or service? So what we're driving towards here is trusted devices, as we stated previously, but also the health of the device. Potentially, we could look to use our investment in Intune plus Defender ATP. That would be Defender Advanced Threat Protection, Microsoft's endpoint detection and response capability, which is now one of the leaders in, in that market. We have these two components that give us the management plus the health. Then we can feed that telemetry into Microsoft Cloud application security. So we can potentially control access to applications or services. How can employees and business guests have a secure way to access corporate resources when not using a managed device? I think this is quite a common scenario where we, we get this question quite often. Granted, the question might change slightly, but the premise of the question largely remains the same. We're dealing with non-trusted devices. This could be bring your own device, BYOD. This could be simply unmanaged devices. Here, we could look at a combination, but additionally, Essentially, rather, we want to be looking at leveraging conditional access. So we want to be looking within the applications that we further want to control. In this example, we've selected email. So Outlook on the web or Outlook web access, where we can make use of conditional access plus application control policies in the light of non-trusted devices. So what this means practically is if you're coming from a trusted device, you can have full access to the email. If you're coming from a non-trusted, non-registered device where we're not getting enough insights into the device, we want to strike that balance between usability and security. So we can introduce policy to grant you access to the email, but limit this to read only as an example, limit the capability to download. How can I take this back to my organization and teams for further discussion, for review? We have outlined just a couple of points that we think are relevant. We have a finite amount of time today in this webinar today, and there are a lot of things to consider. Microsoft does provide some very good guidance around 30, 60, 90 day plans, but we think this needs to be revised slightly to potentially 10, 20, and 30-day plans, as we don't have the luxury of time at the moment. We have taken some of the Microsoft suggestions, reworked them slightly, brought in our experience as security SMEs, and broken these down into suggestion points into virtual groups. These virtual groups will cover identity, device, data and applications, as we've discussed previously. These virtual groups within your organization may or may not look after these specific areas. They may be specific groups within your organization, or they may simply be one or two individuals that wear multiple hats. Let's have a look at these suggestions. For the identity teams, here is your to-do list. Connect all apps for single sign-on. This really reduces the complexity around identity management. It gives us consistency. It sets us up to enforce strong, predictable, reliable policy as it relates to identity. Strong authentication. 
we absolutely need to be using multi-factor authentication and ideally improving that even further and including risk detection policy. So we can dynamically detect in-session risk with an identity. We we'll use more complex algorithms such as machine learning to understand what is normal, if you will, for this user over a period of time. This user <clears throat> has never logged in from this location. Um, or the type of behavior that we're seeing in this logon session is somehow unusual and can take the appropriate action or apply a risk score. This enables us to <clears throat> enforce policy, policy-based access. We need to be cognizant of the terminology that the Microsoft Cybersecurity Group often uses, assume breach. They're not alone in that type of thinking. So what do we do in terms of, of breach containment when we're dealing with an identity? Potentially, I received a phishing email. My credentials have, have been compromised. As a security team, as an identity team, how can I contain that, that breach of credentials? Device teams, here is your to-do list. Register devices with your identity provider. We want to have clear visible, tangible insight into the devices that our users are using and which devices are allocated to which users. Implement mobile device management based security baselines and compliance reporting. We need to be maintaining our security baselines throughout this remote working environment that we found ourselves. It certainly doesn't take away from the baselines that we should and certainly need to have in place. This includes potentially configuration items within the various operating systems, but also the likes of patches. This is not just operating system patches, but also patches that are available for the multitude of applications and software that we may be running on our devices. We need to be using endpoint threat detection to monitor for device risk. If a piece of malware has suddenly come onto my home network where I'm currently operating and is trying to get onto my machine and execute potentially some ransomware or identity compromise or whatever undertaking it may be trying to do, I need to have some endpoint threat detection not only to stop that, but also to provide the telemetry back to the backend teams to further supplement risk controls if and required. Network and infrastructure security teams, here is your to-do list. Enable cloud workload protection. We're using and consuming a vast majority of cloud workloads. We want to be using the, the built-in capabilities that these cloud platforms have to make sure our cloud services, applications, and workloads are protected. We want to reduce attack surface as far as possible. I use the example very simply where our administrators are also compelled to work from home. Are there ways that we can still enable these high privileged access users to work securely, efficiently? The concept known as just-in-time access. So opening up access to our service for administration, remediation, uh, troubleshooting, whatever may be required, but just for a period that's required to complete those tasks and then effectively we shut the door. App and data security teams, here is your to-do list. Agree on label taxonomy and classify all documents and emails with a default label. So what this is talking about is a view on information protection. One possible way of trying to reduce data exfiltration is to use Microsoft's capability around Microsoft information protection and implying making available, not necessarily enforcing, but making available a default internal organization-wide label 
that could grant it be applied by default and if the data that I'm trying to protect needs to be shared externally, managing that out as an exception. There are a number of other examples in, in this space, but there are some very basic steps that we can take quite quickly and avoiding the typical and possible analysis paralysis when we think towards information protection, data classification, labels, taxonomy, etc. Okay, I know that it's been a lot to take in within a short period of time. What are the other next steps that we can take? So as an organization, we have run a number of assessments for customers to understand the security models and architecture. What we're seeing is in a lot of these cases, a decreased ability to control and have an impact over the overall security posture. And we wanna help. In terms of practical next steps, I encourage you to take the steps for your virtual teams as we've discussed. Use them to spark conversation, to ask and validate the question around your security posture. Quite um, recently, just in the last week, Microsoft has released a self-assessment tool that can take you through a self-assessment exercise to validate a lot of the questions you may be asking yourself. If you need to do this for your organization, or if you don't, what do I have currently in place? The self-assessment tool will step you through the various verticals, as we said, that we've spoken through. And I encourage you to take the assessment, review the output, have conversations with your organizations, and develop plans accordingly. As I said before, we are here to help you. So you're more than welcome to share your findings whole or in summary with us as you feel comfortable. My email and the email address of my colleagues will be listed at the end of the presentation. We are happy to take your, your feedback, your insights and your summaries as you feel comfortable to share them with us. And we will provide guidance and insight as you require. I encourage you to visit our website, more specifically our Reimagine Work uh, subsite. This is a single place to get all of the up-to-date information Empire is providing, not only through webinars, but also blogs and commentary. You can also contact us through the various email addresses that are listed at the bottom. I know this has been a lot of content to work through and hopefully it has given you some very quick, short, sharp things that have sparked some thoughts in your mind. As I said, go through the self-assessment. It is a very quick and easy process that you can go through. So right now I'd like to, to thank you for your time and we're almost into our time for the presentation section. I'd like to now transition to the time that we have allocated for, for questions. As Thank <coughs> Thanks, Kevin. Um, there has been a few questions um, that came through. So uh, let's start with uh, David, um, David asks, can you share more information about how to assess device health and do session risk scoring? I know you covered that in some of your slides. I'm not sure if that was fully um, answered there, but maybe you can share some more details there, Gavin. Yes, absolutely. So there are some prerequisites to this um, in terms of the components that we're looking for. We're looking for Intune. Um, could be in a hybrid configuration, 
as I said before, with system center configuration. But we really need that telemetry. So if we're applying a baseline policy, there's a number of things that we want to understand. Is there potentially baseline drift from a security baseline configuration? Is there something going on the device that is contrary to the policy? And that would be from the mobile device management perspective, understanding insights and gleaning that telemetry. Also, we look at Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. This really gives us deep penetration into the device. So Defender ATP runs at the kernel level. It has deep insights into what's going on in Windows. I'm glad to say that this is also in preview for Linux um, and Mac. So we're looking great to both those platforms with great excitement. But if we concentrate for a moment on the Windows side, Defender ATP feeds that telemetry that it's understanding from Windows from an endpoint detection and response capability into to Intune. From okay. an operating system perspective, as well as from a threat perspective. So if we are seeing a threat coming from the device that feeds up into Intune, if we have conditional access, which is essentially the overarching umbrella for control, if you will, this is our security control plane. It's a pivotal part to, to zero trust. We can use this telemetry that's coming from Intune that's fed by Defender ATP to essentially light up our conditional access policy and a permit a session, if you will, if the device is patched up to date, it has no inherent threats on the device, we can allow that session through. If somehow the device has been compromised, it's got some malware on it, we can adjust the threat level accordingly, maybe to medium or high, uh, as an example, and control and limit access accordingly. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um, David also asked, and Daryl um, seemed to want to know the same, um, and says that I'd love to see how the tools mentioned, uh, Intune, et cetera, fit together to form one solution. Um, and Daryl uh, also asked the same, saying um, how, how, how you get to the single pane of glass to improve manageability. Mm. Really both good, very good questions. So there's, there's two options. So we have Microsoft Threat Protection. Essentially, there's a trinity of advanced threat detection capability. We, we call it the trinity of ATPs, if you will, because we have very specific focus on, on email. We have specific focus on identity, and as I mentioned previously, specific focus on device. Microsoft Threat Protection will roll up this telemetry into that single plane of glass, uh, if you will. That is very focused on the Microsoft capability. So it can pull in some telemetry from Microsoft Cloud App Security. So that gives us coverage across our cloud applications, uh, the sessions, the likes of impossible travel and those types of, of scenarios. So Microsoft Threat Protection gives us that overview of the telemetry. It will roll up events into incidents. So as I said previously, this has a very specific focus on the Microsoft stack. If we need to be looking outside of the Microsoft stack, so we have the Microsoft stack, but we have potentially signal that is coming from other locations. This could be proxies, it could be firewalls, it could be threat intelligence, if you will. We would look to, to Azure Sentinel, which is Microsoft security information and event management platform which essentially rolls up all of this capability into a seam. So it's a cloud-based seam where we can roll up all of this telemetry, all of these events into incidents, actionable incidents that make it easier for our security teams to respond. So once again, that would give you the single plane of glass view if you needed something more than just focusing on the Microsoft stack. Okay, thanks. Um, there is one from uh, Mike asking, what are the best ways of messages to help secure buy-in from the C-level to move to a zero trust? Mm, that's a really good question. I think 
you know a lot of this needs to be quantified we we know when myself personally we've had conversations with the boards when you're dealing with uh, data exfiltration you're dealing with incidents it's for me there's probably a number of key rules don't get them overly excited you know state the facts uh, avoid technical jargon give them clear concise information in terms of what is our current posture uh, as i said avoid technical jargon lay it out plainly in terms of this is our current posture what i've seen very effective is don't bring problems bring solutions right so state the current position they want to know are we in an okay position or we're not are there things that we need to be doing now, cyber is always a hot to topic at the boardroom table as i said don't get them over excited make the risks very clear but also propose solutions in terms of how you um, foresee the organization either mitigating or potentially accepting the risk sometimes the risk the cost of mitigating a risk is too high so we need to come with with alternatives and get that buy-in by positioning a roadmap not a roadmap that's too extensive that's too complicated to break it down into short-term achievable goals um, goals that are achievable because we want to be showing success I think that's a good way to to successfully obtain buy-in is to achieve yeah. some low-hanging fruit if you will and then build on that build some trust okay thanks um, James asked uh, you have covered a number of to do's in this which all sounds critical right now what would you consider to be the top two or three to do's that we really need to do right now so multi-factor authentication um, we're seeing a lot of attacks still on identity and as I said if you as an organization believe you have multi-factor authentication covered it's certainly worth <clears throat> revisiting as I said in the presentation we're only as strong as our weakest link and in certain scenarios in certain cases multi-factor authentication can be bypassed if you will in terms of the capability to still use legacy authentication so legacy authentication unfortunately is still a glaring hole for us that we have coming through from a number of platforms and and services simply with the capability that it can't use multi-factor authentication okay yeah. the other thing i would say is make sure that if you're using vpn as an example you have the latest firmware on your firewalls and all of that type of networking equipment is, is up to date because we're seeing targeted attacks because a lot of organizations that we speak to are still heavily using utilizing VPN services. So make sure that that's up to date. Okay. Uh, and then Sam uh, asked, what agent list options are there for this? Hmm. That's a really good question. So if if we assume that as an example, we we don't have the Intune agent uh, installed yet, or we don't have, as an example, Defender ATP agent or the information protection agent, it it does limit our capability slightly. There are options in terms of managing this through telemetry that we get in session. So if we take the security control plane in the Microsoft context, this would be conditional access. There's still a fair amount of information that we can glean in session, either through machine learning, if this has been going on, user has been logging in for a period of time. Microsoft has a lot of threat intelligence that it pushes into the system. So if you've ever heard of the Microsoft security intelligence, Graph. This is essentially a system that operates in the back end that takes telemetry from Bing, Xbox, and a, a number of, of Microsoft services. So that allows in session control where we could see do we believe that this user is coming from an IP address that is known to be bad? 
and it's likely not the actual user, but there's potentially some um, identity compromise. So there's a lot of capability that's available in session that wouldn't require an agent that we can still manage the risk quite effectively. Okay. Uh, and Melanie asked, I work in a health organization that largely has a mobile workforce. Mobile phones is what we use mostly to communicate and exchange data. Our users would be at the bottom end of the skill range, so we have limited the effort to log in into mobile applications such as Outlook. What are other alternatives are there that then uh, multi-factor authentication? Essentially, this would be too difficult for all of our staff to use. Anything else they can use instead of MFA for those uh, low skilled staff? Mm. So I think we, we are shifting towards password lists. Um, that's something that, that comes to mind. There, there's still a lot of work being done uh, in that space. But I think it may be something to worth consider because even um, the recommendations around multi-factor authentication, um, if we could use something like the Authenticator app, which is available on, on the mobile platform, it, it's simply a process of an approval or, or reject. There would still need to be some, some exercise around education to, to uplift uh, the users there. Um, if that's simply not an option, um, I think I would revert back to very similar to the previous question in terms of, of managing that from a risk perspective. If we could get those devices enrolled and we could manage them, it certainly takes some onus away from, from the user. I don't think we can get away from education in, entirely, uh, unfortunately, because there may be some effect where we're not enforcing multi-factor authentication, but there may be a case and a point in time where something has happened to the phone. Maybe there's a malicious app app as an example that's been loaded on, on the phone that's taking some action on the phone that could potentially uh, increase the risk um, on the device and potentially the risk to applicate, uh, access to the data, if you will. So there may be, under normal circumstances, the session would be unaffected, but if we're using a risk rating and we see the risk rating go from low to high, we're going to have to take some kind of action, whether this is blocking the user's access to read only, which is possible. Uh, there's going to be some education needed to, to support that. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's basically changing it to a managed device or managed applications, which then in effect makes it multiple layers of authentication. It's not the same as MFA, but at least you do have uh, more, more authentication there. Correct. It's it's difficult at the moment. I think once we get to password lists, um, more password list supported capability, there potentially could be things like um, FIDO2 supported dongles, hardware type um, supported capability, where it may ne neglect the need, not neglect, but reduce the reliance on, on multi traditional multi-factor authentication. And I think we've still got a little way to get to go, unfortunately. Yeah. And then there's one last one. Uh, Sam asked a follow-up question. Does the Microsoft MFA allow evaluation of uh, antivirus on the endpoint like Duo, uh, Duo MFA? So conditional access, yes. This could be part of the, the policy. Uh, evaluation, yes. So not MFA per se, but what we have is basically these these units, these blocks uh, working together. So we have conditional access being our control plan. We can have MFA as a control, whether we enforce that for every session, whether we do that dynamically, and we could supplement that um, from a device health perspective, as we've discussed through typically in tune where we can get that telemetry uh, from the device and then dynamically take action. So we won't necessarily prompt for MFA if we believe everything is okay. Your 
your risk level uh, is low. If that changes, we could step up to MFA or force a password reset or a number of other controls. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that answered all uh, all the questions. If there are other questions that you might not want to pose uh, in here and you want to contact uh, Gavin uh, about it, then feel free to uh, to give him a uh, send him an email to to get that or get in touch with your contact at um, Empire or Intigen, um, and then we can follow up with yourselves. Thank you very much for joining our session today um, and look out for our next webinar in a, in a few weeks time. So thank you very much for joining everyone. Thank you.